Hello there, Chris here from Becker's Models, and this is part two of my very comprehensive and long review of the Kotaro 132nd scale Supermarine Spitfire Mark 1A mid. What a mouthful. In this section, like I promised in part one, I will show you how this kit goes together. We've got the cockpit subsection with a little freeloader in there and the main aircraft itself. After I show you the, the build and the processes and the tips that you need to watch out for, um, mainly you need to be really good at cleaning your parts, unlike some other ones, other builds I've seen online, that um, that's where they're getting to their troubles. Okay, after I do that, I'm going to compare uh, the kit itself to other kits of a similar ilk. So I'll compare it to the 148 scale Tamiya Mark I mid, so the exact same subject, and I'll compare it to the Tamiya superlative 132nd scale late stage uh, Merlin Marks, the Mark 8, 9, and 16. And so you can get an idea, well, what am I getting for the money? Why don't I have an engine? That's another question people ask, and you know, why is there no engine? So that's what we'll do. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to bring, um, uh, I'm going to show you a, a list of pros and cons that I've come up with, and also some, uh, a lot of my fellow modelers have who have built this and have painted this, and some areas where I think Kotari can improve to end with. And of course, my final recommendation, if you don't want to watch, you know, I don't know how long this video is going to be, another 30 minutes, 40 minutes, go buy it. It's that good. It's brilliant. It's a fantastic kit. Uh, I can't wait to do this, but I have a slew of other things that I've promised to do first. And as you can see, I'm fondling the propeller. Okay, it's on a nice long shaft here. And one of the great things about this having no engine in here, this can be motorized very easily for wheels up display. Anyway, that's, you know, there's probably about three of you out there who want to do that. The rest of you want to have this nicely parked on the ground. And it's almost the perfect Spitfire kit for, for what you want. So let's get stuck into it. The first four steps of the instructions deal with the cockpit. And the parts count on this kit is not that high, just over 100. And I would suggest, and I think um, my good modeling mate John Colasante has rightly put out, that about 70% of the work involved in this kit is inside this little tub, inside the cockpit itself. Okay, and that's good because these parts fit like an absolute dream and they come together in a very smart, uh, logical, thought out way. Now, just the only thing I have, um, where's my pointy sticky thing? The only thing I have glued together here is the seat the three-piece seat, the side bits, and the um, the bucket itself, because I wanted to use it as a test bed to try. This is the Tamiya 132 scale spit um, seated pilot. You know, oh, I've done nothing to him, just cleaned him up, and I wanted to see how well he fits inside the seat. All he needs is just a little bit of a um, modification of his uh, the parachute that he sits on. That just needs to be filled out a little bit more to make up for that obvious dent that's in the bottom of the seat. So I'm going to take this apart. We're going to go backwards here because I want to explain how this goes together. Now I haven't put every single part in here. I've done the main frames, um, the fuel tank bulkhead, the instrument panel, the main frame here with the armored plate, and then the two rear frames at the back here. And let's take it apart. So these side walls as you can see, uh, just under tension, there's no glue. They clip in here, and this is the first thing you need to do, and you need to get just right. And it's something I will repeat throughout this whole video. You must ensure that all the cleanup surfaces, all the surfaces that mate with another surface, must be clean. I go through a process, I mean, I, I have a set of fairly well used sprue cutters here. I cut off the sprue nub, I then get a knife, I trim back as much as I can, I then get my sanding stick, and then I might even use a sanding, uh, you know, 1000, whatever, um, sanding uh, sponge. I want to make sure that those surfaces are perfect because this is Wingnut Wings heritage. And what that means is you can't even have paint on some of these mating surfaces or the, the tolerances are that tight. So with that warning done, let's see if I can get these um, sidewalls off and it will come apart because the only fit, and I wouldn't call it a problem, uh, but I would call it just something to be wary of, is that these bulkheads that slip into, as you can see, it all falls out, that slip into the um, the floor. It's not, a, it's the fuselage floor. Okay, put them aside. Some of them have a somewhat sloppy fit. Okay, 
some of them are quite tight. So this one at the back here, and they're all keyed, just like with Tamiya. See the, the notch at the bottom there of that one? Okay, that's obviously goes in the center line there at the back. That's a nice tight fit, that one. That's for the flare, the flare rack that goes down the bottom there. There's a few extra parts I haven't put there. This one here is keyed off to the right. See how it goes to starboard? Okay, so you can't get that one wrong. That goes to the right. That one is a fairly tight fit. Stands by itself. But I did find that the main um, bulkhead here with the seat is a bit of a sloppy fit. Okay, this one's keyed to, to port side, to the left. So we go left, left there and there's the notch there. Okay, so very smart of Kotari. You shouldn't be able to get these messed up. Uh, it should be fairly obvious, but if you like to fly through the instructions quickly, um, that's it. that just helps you there. So as you can see, that's this one has the sloppiest fit, and by sloppiest, I mean, I mean, I can still, I can almost carry the whole weight of it. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it could just be a little bit tighter. It's no big deal at all. All right, so, uh, there's the armor plate for the, the headdress there. All I've done is cleaned up. And again, you must make sure that all the sides of the bulkheads here must be perfectly clean or they will not slot properly into these side plates. Okay. So we can see that there's areas where they slot into here along these, these gaps in the frames. You must make sure that those frames are nice and clean and perfect. The, um, the seat detail on this is exquisite. Now I will try to later on in the video compare. Uh, I've got some some ideas for those of you who like their pilots sitting in their seat. I do have an area bonus uh, Spitfire set that includes the seat, so I'll compare the two a little bit later. Okay, so that's it there. I think this is better detail than the Tamiya kits, uh, the way they've done it, and that just fell together with no. I glue that together. That fell together no problem, and it dry fits to the back of this uh this bulkhead you got these two two um holes in the bottom there and they just slot in like so give it a little push done whoops <laughs> i just dropped it all right so the fit yeah yeah like i said there's the fit is near perfect near perfect you just need to be careful now this uh there's actually two parts that's just slotted in the back there and it's a perfect press fit there there's the instrument panel with the individual dials and with the um, the compass carrier is actually molded in plastic, nice and thin too. Unlike the photo which the Tamiya like to use, which is um, <laughs> damn hard to, to bend. Again, we've got keyed keyed slots going like that. There, you have to put them in first before you do the rudder assembly. So this is the rudder assembly. The only issue here that you have to be careful of is when, and I actually have glued this one in to be sure to be sure is this is the rear facing plate here, okay, which has two triangular notches that go in for uh, this plate underneath. You must get that aligned properly. Uh, if you've got it back to front, I don't know how you did that, but there it is. And if I can just show you clearly there, you can see that it's askew. See how the rudder pedals are askew? That's because that's the way Kotari have designed the kit and you'll find that later on. When you put the rudder on, the rudder is skewed to the right. And that's how they, they park them. They don't park them flush, they park them like that. And that's how it's locked. Uh, so yeah, so this piece has two posts underneath. Two posts underneath. And I won't do it on camera because it is fiddly, but it's it will go in. And there's two corresponding holes there. You just, you just need to feed either side of the, like that, through the bulkhead, around there like that. And then that just keys in to that slot there. Oh, there you go, I did it on camera. That's how easy it is. I'll just throw it aside. So that is the cockpit done. Um, there's a few extra pieces you've got to put in. Okay, a few. <laughs> there's probably another 10 or 12 pieces. But those, those were the major ones. As you saw at the start of the video, it's a sub-assembly by itself. I can't find any problems with it whatsoever. And that will be so much fun. And I have seen heaps of builds. I'll put some pictures up here as we go, as I'm talking. I've seen so many builds, so many people are going to get such an enjoyment out of uh, adding all the detail to this. There is a lot of cables and wires that you can add. Uh, Kotari give you some ideas about, you know, um, adding the rigging to a lot of the, um, the cables in here on the inside of the fuselage as well. So you can really go to town. I don't think an aftermarket cockpit is necessary. For those of you who don't want to deal with, you know, 20 individual 
dials here on the for the decals for the instrument panel. Perhaps you'll you'll wait for a Yahoo or Edward panel, but this is uh, again photos. Hopefully you're seeing right now as I'm talking. You don't need it. All right, let's move on to the main frame itself. How does the aircraft go together? Well, well, wow. Yeah. I'll put my cards on the table. If you are not a regular visitor to my channel, you must understand that I am one, a Tamiya fanboy, and two, uh, due to the nature of my hobby, I consider this my version of the hobby. I like buildability. I like to be able to sit down with a kit and not have it fight me. And the, the added bonus is I love having a kit designed and engineered in such a way that you know that these designers built this kit themselves. The chaps at Armour Hobby, for example, a newcomer, uh, another newcomer, um, they're like that. They're, they're the guys who, you know, they design it, they do a print, they put the thing together and they, and they work out, oh, this doesn't work, we'll try this instead. Unlike some other nameless companies that just seem to pump out kits, they either don't care about the accuracy or they just get it close enough, you know, they throw rivets on where they're not needed and, you know, the instructions are meh. You know, they're okay, but you, you really, there's just, a, there's a barrier you're trying to cross and it's like, do you guys really care about what you're doing or is this just a job, you know? So the thing with Kotari, you can see the passion that goes into the way that this thing's been designed and put together. And I salute that and I love that. That's personal to me. This is a very straightforward build. If you are having problems building this kit, it's your fault. Uh, you haven't cleaned the parts correctly. You haven't read the instructions. They make a big bloody book for a reason, okay? They have thought it through. They know what they're doing. Follow the instructions. Don't just go, oh, I'll do this first and I'll do this later because that's the way I like to do things. No, 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 do what they say. It will work. Uh, I did not have a single problem with this. The only problem I had is I didn't glue it all together. If I had glued parts together, things would fit easier. And as you can see, a lot of the things are on under tension. They just tape together. So enough waffling, let's take this apart and I'll show you um, the greatness that's involved in this. And oh, I've forgotten to put the landing gear on. If I get time, I will put it on because a lot of you probably think that that's important. I don't, I've only got my little tail wheel sticking out. Okay, where shall I start with this? Well, let's start with the propeller. Yes, I actually have glued the propeller together. Let's see if I can actually get him off out of the, um, the prop shaft. Okay, I glued him together because it's all one color. And this is the de Havilland, and I'm not doing the de Havilland, which is the B and C options, I'm doing the A option. And yeah, <laughs> that fell together. It's got a keyed part inside there to align the props, the prop blades and the spinner. If you don't key that together properly, these holes won't match up. Basic sort of Tamiya level of thought thoughtfulness. Perfect fit. Okay, let's go ahead and take the fuselage off the wings. Now, as you may have seen in part one, the, uh, actually, I'm going, there we go. I'm, I'm doing it the wrong way. The, the fillets here are actually attached to the wing, not to the fuselage. So that's the way they've engineered it. They've engineered it so, and I believe they've done that for a reason, because if you look at the parts, the way that they're, um, <laughs> the way that they're numbered, they're actually designed for later marks. So oop, I've got an ant flying across my wing. Get off there, buddy. He's, uh, a bit, he's attracted to some of the paint water that I've got here from my F-14. So the only major seam that I can see that needs filling, if you don't get your alignment just right, is this, this one here across the back. Okay, And there's quite a few parts here that have to come together. But as you can see, that's about the only major one. Uh, a lick of Mr. Surfacer. The other seam is this one here running down the spine. But uh, yeah, I don't think that's going to need any trouble whatsoever. I think you're going to be fine with that one too. So, oh, there's one more piece of, of tape. A lot of these things are going to come apart. You now you might see a couple of gaps here and there. Now, the reason why there's a gap here or there is it's not under pressure and it's not glued together. Once you push these things together, the gaps just disappear. So hopefully I should be able to, there we go, take it out. Boom. Put the fuselage aside. Let's look at the wing. So the wing has these two fillets that fit quite nice, but you must get the clean up right, and I will zoom in. You must get the clean up right, and it's one area where I think Hotari can improve. They've put the sprue attachment points on the lip, inside lip of these fillets, okay? It's a little bit tricky to clean that up, and in fact, that one there is not quite right. I need to fix it. 
on either side okay you need to get these clean because these then face up against the inside of the fuselage hard so get them just right so they go on there like that and I'll remove those parts so you can have a look because there's not that many parts to the wing apart from uh, structure, major structural parts but everything has just fitted together just right again if we look under under tension disappears okay so if there was a little bit of glue there that would go same with these wings I did find the landing gear on the right side the starboard side wing is a little, still a little bit tight so I mean if I had a clamp on there these wings will you know will disappear as you can see the seam will disappear but without tension it doesn't whereas on the port wing it doesn't need even need tape they just fall together so there's there's something going on, on with the the right landing gear one so that's something to keep uh, mind of they are very 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 tight I'll show you them in a minute let's just get this on I might actually just edit this bit out while I just take all this tape off let's talk about the wing assembly I've taken all the, the tape off here you can see that one of the ailerons has popped out the ailerons um, are keyed so they must go in uh, each way on each wing okay and they can be posed if, if you want to you can actually deflect them as I would and you can deflect them on the ground or in the air uh, but yeah they're they're fantastic the the trailing edges on those are razor thin fantastic so I'll just pull those ailerons out and let's look at the um, before we take the wing structure off let's look at these fillets so the fillets have a tab here and that corresponds to there and clicks in like so and goes around there's no actual tabs or lining up points here at the rear they actually just butt join against there which is a little bit of a pain I would have liked to have seen another tab there or some sort of alignment just to click it in perfectly but just take a bit of time with your, your extra thin glue to get in there like that and you'll be fine and again they're keyed you can't get them wrong either way so before I zoom in let's have a look what the wing structures are like um, the uh, upper wings have the longer piece and then the lower wing snicks into there and the fit is perfect so don't have to worry about that take the other wing off yep oh, I've missed a piece of tape okay there we are <laughs> So let's have a look at the wing structure itself. There's a major spar that they include that goes in through there and I have actually glued that in. But these um, inserts for the landing gear are a snap fit. And as I said on the other one, the right hand side one is not quite flush and I can feel a little bit of movement there. These parts you need to clean up perfectly. Again, I keep saying that throughout the, this whole review but it's just, the, the tolerances of the Kotari have designed, like I can't even get it out and that's just dry fitted in, that they have designed in this kit are super, super high. And uh, you might find yourself having to do a little bit of fettling here just to get things to fit. Uh, I mean, everything has got, you know, keyed location points around there. You can't get it wrong where it goes in. You've got these hooks going over the main spar there. Uh, but I think I might need to shave off a little bit of those. But yeah, amazing fit can't fault that at all. Let's have a look at the fuselage next. What makes the Kotari Spitfire fuselage quite different to any other uh, kit that, out there on the market of a typical you know, um, single engine um, prop fighter of World War II is the way that they've engineered the top parts, the top engine cowl, the armoured fuel tank in front of the cockpit and the bridge or or this you know, piece at the back going up to the tail. So traditionally this would have been just two pieces and then you've got to deal with the seam going all the way down there and you've got to deal with the seam going all the way down there. Kotari have not done that. The only seam you have to worry about is along the actual tail, just here, okay? Um, which is fantastic. <laughs> now, so what we've got here, this is the, a few things are taped on, but a lot of these things are press fit. Okay, so this bridge piece or whatever, I've got to do a little tiny bit of clean up there on one of the sprue points. Can you see that in there? Let's zoom in so you can see what the hell I'm talking about. Upside down, Miss Jane, that way. Okay, so I have seen a few, there's a few builds where people have had a little bit of trouble aligning this piece. I think the trick here is not to apply any paint uh, on the underside here at all. You need to paint a little bit on in here for the lights and so forth, but also not to splay the edges now again it would have been nice to see there is one attachment point in there let's get this out you can see that there's one here one notch which corresponds to that gate point there and that's probably enough actually maybe another one at the rear would have been good to include but you need to insert it to the rear like that first and then press down and then just 
I can't see any problem if those, and I've tried it with the cockpit inside, um, if you've just got to get it aligned just right, just to squeeze it just enough. Remember this is a lap panel join here. It's very subtle and on some Spitfires it doesn't really exist, on some it does. Because you've got to remember, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, these things were not made in jewellery factories and yeah, you know, they were made extremely well but we're talking 1930s technology. There are gaps, there are laps, there are parts that don't fit exactly and you know, Richard Alexander, he's shown several photos of parts, you know, big gaps around panels here and at the front. It's all legit. It doesn't have to be perfectly smooth. Uh, um, you know, maybe that's a trait with IPMS. You've got to get construction exactly right. Well, actually, the real thing isn't constructed exactly right. So, this piece fits lovely. I'll actually take that off so we can keep on disassembling. All right, at the front, we've got the top engine cowling. Now, remember, if you watched part one, I motioned that there was a mold seam line running from here to here all the way across. I've kept this one on this part here. If you can see that, I'll run my finger over it. It's still there, it's still a bit raised, but I've removed it from this bump all the way back. Very, very easy. I just used my SMS ceramic scraper, done that, a series of sanding sticks, and lastly with a sanding sponge and with a, with a polisher and it's gone, it's completely gone, without removing any detail to these Zeus fasteners at the rear. So, again, you can see a small gap there. That's, you know, you're thinking, oh, it's not a very good fit. Press it down, disappears, okay? So these things, none of this is glued on, so let's just remove the tape, okay? And you can see that there's one of the features. That is a full prop shaft there, yeah, no engine. Cry me a river. Um, Let's just take the other cowlings off. So these side cowlings and this rear one is, are all notched in and the fit is perfect. You've got to put this, this cowling here, the bottom one on last, even before you put the fuselage on, but there are no problems. Um, there's been no problems with any of the fit here. Clean the parts off, make sure that the, the parts are facing the correct way and you'll have no problem whatsoever. Um, I should probably take all this tape off screen, but I don't I want to show you as we go along Okay, so again, excuse my children upstairs making like elephants. It's all keyed in here correctly uh, The alignment is just just perfect. Okay, we take these parts off again The keyed you've got a box outline and a box to there and on the other side if I can get rid of this blasted little bit of tape Again keyed with the box there again. Now if you look at this nice big chunky bit at the, at the front and you're thinking, oh, how do I get an engine in there? There's a lot of room to put an engine in there. Don't worry about that. If, you, if you're going to go aftermarket for an engine, there's plenty of space there. All right, so this piece, the, uh, if I can get it out, I've got to push it from on the side, is the fuel tank cover. Oop, it doesn't want to come out. There we go. It's a super tight fit. Okay, it's got four posts there, uh, and the I mean posts, not just little tiny little divots, and they slide in to these slots here. Okay, great fit, unbelievable. I think um, Airfix are trying to do this in 148, but I don't think they succeeded. I can't remember. I don't. I'm, I'm off Airfix. I don't build Airfix anymore in the small scales because I don't think their quality control is anywhere near good enough to to spend any money. Okay, where do we go? Let's go to the rear, okay. <laughs> um, instead of bagging airfix all the time. So you can see, see the rudders put, going off to starboard there? That's properly designed that way, okay? Don't, you, you can if you want to, because I'll show you in a second. You can modify the part that way. Um, it just goes in there under tension. And you can see that that gate is skewed to the right. So if you want to modify it, maybe you can see it that way better. Just trim it and it just slots in there like that. Okay, perfect fit. Be very careful of the aerial mount up here. In fact, off screen, once I've finished disassembling this, I will tape that up so I don't break that off. I seem to always do that. The, um, the elevators are posed down, and again, you've got these tabs there that have been deflected. If you want to modify that, very, very easy to do. And you can't put these upside down because of the way they've keyed them. See how it's offset, you can't actually do it. Very smart indeed. The um, these, uh, I have glued these together, but they would they, that just slotted in. So that's how good the fit is. Push it in. Doesn't even need glue, in my opinion. It's done. 
Okay, the um, the tail wheel again. That's a friction fit. That just slots in there like that. Okay, comes out, and let's disassemble the fuselage. You will need to clamp the tail here. It seems to be I cleaned it up as best I can, but uh, you might need to just put a small clamp on there while you're letting that set, and that's the seam you will need to remove. And underneath, you're going to have this seam uh, to remove, which actually. If you're very smart, you can get away with not having to do much at all, and you're not going to see it if you're going to be parking this on the ground. But as you can see, with just the two fuselage halves there with one piece of tape, uh, yeah, there's no glue, and it just fits there perfectly. Let's talk landing gear. The way the Kotari have engineered uh, this the landing gear is you have a full spar sort of arrangement off the landing gear strut uh, with that small little re uh, connecting rod there and that slides in here um, as you can see I've got this one fixed so I'm just going to show you what goes on so it's a very sturdy fix but there is a small fault if you just zoom in there you can see how I've had to cut a small notch in the end of the uh, wheel well assembly see it's just falling out there just in there okay and if I just zoom around to the other one you'll see what I've done is I've noted with a small black pen if you cut out that small triangle in there which you'll never see from the underside you'll never see from from any angle whatsoever so you're not removing any uh, permanent part what it allows you to do is uh, normally you know the wing obviously be closed up but I'm just showing you this is it means that that can slot in there perfectly now if you try it with that's the starboard side I'll try it with the port side one if you try it with this one okay my own camera there if we try it you get a lot of resistance and I have seen uh, I think there's one or two builders who have completed this section okay you can get it in there but see how I've lifted up the wheel strut the wheel the landing wheel has come out of its thing okay so you, you either have to remove weight and in fact look at that I've left a little bit of black ink there you'll either have to remove some meat here or from the um, this this piece I think it's just easy just to get your sprue cutters and just do a simple chop and it's done. While we're talking about that, for the three of you out there who want to do this wheels up, I can confirm that the, um, the doors fit absolutely perfectly closed. Okay, the only issue is going to be you must have, um, we need to modify the, um, the landing gear. So let me just move this out of the way and I'll show you an interesting part of the engineering. So you'll notice that the flat spot for this particular uh, wheel is up actually up here. The reason is I've turned this around, whereas on the other one, the flat spot's on the bottom. And what Kotari have very carefully done is they have keyed the wheel hubs. If I can get this out, I actually had to modify this one. But you'll see that the wheel hubs are different sized. So you can only fit them in their corresponding um, landing struts so that's a really good and it's just a press fit fits perfectly and it lines up with a flat spot so you get the right alignment so alignment and strength and everything for this is fantastic but for those of you like I said the three of us who want to do wheels up uh, what I've done is I've just sanded away a little bit of this end here so I can actually spin this tire around so you don't see the flat bit so you don't want to see that flat bit you want to see get that hidden by the wheel well door and it's a bit of a tight fit so the door will fit on here like so um, and I'll do it in a much more extensive a way of how you can modify this later but basically you have to cut off most of this here and round off the end of the landing gear strut to show that it's actually um, has been turned inward and that's it so the next thing to discuss are clear parts I forgot to put the clear parts on this is how I'm going to do it um, with a one-piece canopy and windscreen and it fits perfectly there are other builds out there where you've got the separate ones this Malcolm hood slides back here over this perfectly there's no trouble trouble at all if you've got everything aligned and you've got that spine down nice and tight it will go I just wanted to see how my particular configuration would work and yeah it's an absolute perfect fit okay the windscreen goes on no problem whatsoever and the last thing to talk about are pilots uh, I did allude to it before but here's the here's the seat all done up okay that's the Tamiya Spitfire pilot from the Mark 9 kit and uh, he just needs a little bit of movement underneath 
uh, I might just cut away or add a bit of material down the bottom there. This is the pilot seat from the Aero Bonus set from Ares. This particular one. Okay. And yeah, the, the pilot in comparison to the Tammy one is a little bit undersized, and in fact, you can almost fit the entire seat inside the other seat. It doesn't have as good detail. Again, like I said before, I think the Kotari seat is much better detailed. Uh, but of course the pilot himself is much better detailed compared to the Tamiya plastic one. So if you want to go for this one or do a bit of a kit bash between the two, that would work. But what I would do and what I will most likely do is I'll probably cut away a lot of this seat so I can just fit his body inside the Kotari seat and just um, have those, see all the, um, the straps already built in and you should be able to use um, some fabric seat belts to go through the back. I want to compare the Kotari Mark 1 Spitfire to pretty much the best Spitfire model kit on the market beforehand and that's the Tamiya Late Merlin Spit. So this is uh, Mark 9 that I've started to assemble uh, which has the C-Wing I think from memory. Um, so what we have here and as you can see the dimensions are about the same. There's the This sprue is Kotari, this is Tamiya and you will notice if you compare that leading edge, hopefully I can get the light to catch, yes there are many more um, rivets on the Tamiya kit. Now, do they actually exist on the real thing? Um, maybe, maybe not. Okay, but if we flip this over and compare the upper wing, there we go, in shot, you can see again the lack of rivets on the leading edge, whereas the Tamiya kit has them all. Now, they may need to be filled to be completely accurate. All right. So the, um, the level of quality is very, very similar. The plastic quality is also very similar. Um, and the level of detail is, again, apart from the fact that they just add some additional rivets, the, um, the gun panels, you can't compare like for like because, you know, we're going from a Mark 1 to a Mark 9, uh, are pretty much the same. So there's that sprue done. Let me just get a few more to just to quickly compare. So here are the fuselage halves for the Mark 9, and you can see at a glance why Kotari have used that engineering option of using this one-piece spine, because when you close up the Tamiya one, there are, is two lines of rivets there that if you don't get rid of that seam perfectly, uh, will pretty much disappear, okay? And all the rivets are recessed all the way along. And they're all about the same size and they're all about equidistant, whereas of course on the Katari it's lapped panels and raised rivets. So again, can't really compare like for like because you know it's a later airframe, might have had more flush rivets on. I now want to compare the cockpit part. So this one here is the Mark 9 Tamiya and this is the Kotari. So let's first look at the bulkheads. Okay, and you see I've actually drilled out these on mine. Okay, can you see there? Uh, I've started to drill out some of the some of the ones at the top, but I've left the ones down the bottom uh, recessed. So the ones at the top here, and they still have to be cleaned up a little bit more. This one's a work in progress from years ago. Uh, okay, so looking at these, they are quite comparable. All right, they've done the same thing. If we can look over here, I'll try to zoom in with uh, in post there. So they've they've pretty much done the same thing. Um, the detail looks almost identical with those frames, okay? But what's really interesting, and I'll have to grab the other sprue, so here's the sidewall detail on the Tamiya, which is fantastic, okay? So you've got the oxygen bottles, you've got the throttle quadrant, uh, some of the other stuff here, and upside down Miss Jane, oh, no, it was the right way around. Uh, you've got uh, some of the other parts here. Now, I would contend that the Kotari ones are actually better quality. So here they are here. Let's compare like for like. And I believe, yes, I had to actually glue on the um, oxygen bottles on that one, whereas the Kotari is, is done there. And so there's much better frame detail in between the parts on the Kotari, and there's many more parts there um, compared to the Tamiya one. So, yes, and then on the other side, you can see there's more lines, more raised rivets, whereas on the other side, it's, it's quite bland. Um, and also that extends to the floor. The floor pieces on the Tamiya aren't as detailed and I'll get out the cockpit and we'll have a look at the instrument panel too. So there's the Katari instrument panel and there's the setup for the uh, Tamiya. So you can see how Tamiya, 
are using you got a little bit of photo etched mount there that has to go around your compass you see the glare there whereas they've molded in plastic there i'm just looking for the instrument panel here it is it's completely different on the mark on the mark 9 of course compared to the the mark 1 but yeah, I think the detail is as good or better out of the box as the Tamiya kit. So again, the only thing I can really find better on the Tamiya kit is, of course, one of these little things. That's a, a Merlin, a late stage, a late supercharger um, uh, Merlin. Um, not the early one that, that's used in the Mark One, so it's quite a bit bigger. This builds up very nicely, uh, but you've got to get that construction with all these pipes and this pipe work absolutely perfectly aligned and in fact I've left mine, um, it's only dry fitted a few of them because if you don't, you can't get, particularly the starboard side panel, you can't get that on nice and flush because these panels have to be perfectly located. And what's really interesting, even Tammy has got a mould seam line on theirs, whoops, in camera Chris, all the way along there, you can see that, just the same as Kotari, it's the, it's the nature of the slide moulding, they, they have to leave one there. Alright, I'm going to look at one more thing I think. Before I try little Jimmy out here with his, um, on the seat, the other thing that I noticed is that I reckon the seat detail on the, this is the Katari parts here in this hand, I reckon they're better than the, um, than the Tamiya one. So I've got the Tamiya parts here. So it does a similar, similar method of, there's the bucket, okay, and it has, a, it has a frame it sits on, and there's the side pieces there. So the side pieces don't really have a lot of detail. Yes, you put a, you've got to glue a handle on there, uh, and then on the inside it's pretty bland, whereas on the Kotari ones, they've drilled out the bottoms there and the handles are already built in, but you've got all this recessed and you've got these raised rivets and extra parts there. I think I think Kotari is better out of the box. So Tamiya have really re <laughs> revived the 148 scale aircraft line, coming up with some fantastic, highly detailed uh, kits. These are not beginner kits like they had of old, where it's just two sprues and and you're done. So this is the 148 scale Mark One, and it is comparable. It's the mid uh, one to the Kotari kit. So why am I comparing a 148 scale kit? Well, you can get this one for about half or even a third of the price of Kotari, and you might consider, well, let's let's have a 148 instead. So so the first thing we have to compare again, just like on the 132 spits, is uh, rivet details. So what Tamiya have done quite rightly is the same as Kotari. There are no leading edge rivets here on the underside, if I flip this over, and also, in fact, across almost the entire wing. There are no rivets, okay? Just like on Kotari, they've got it quite right. Um, the rivet detail is, you know, restrained and how it's supposed to be. There are raised rivets on the outside, just like on Kotari and also underneath we've got a combination of some there are some panels most of these panels are flush where they're a little bit yeah, similar on the Kotari there as well so they're the same now when we go to the fuselage halves let me bring out the big boy okay you can see what Tammy are still using an old-school engineering technique although they have included um, a new innovation whereas the panels on the fuselage this is a Tammy a little one You've got these inserts so by doing these inserts what they've done and there's there's the other option you've got a, uh, this options for open open doors so you can see what it's like so what they've done is they've used the insert on the fuselage there that just snicks in there okay and you get a nice lapped joint over the fuel tank cover and also back here the only problem is of course you've now got you know a seam to fill from the rudder all the way down there all the way across to there and also you got this little I don't know why they did that they did a little little part here right at the top above the prop so you don't get the same engineering of the spine from Kotari and no rivets there's zero rivet detail apart from the Zeus fasteners here at the front and a few along the fillet but there's zero rivet detail going back apart from a, an access patch that's a hatch at the rear so that's the main difference that they're employing there. Uh, so let's move finally to the cockpit just to show you a slight difference. Here's the Tamiya cockpit all built up with the pilot. So they do include a pilot there, even though he's got, I don't know why they do that with the hands on the lap. Like, why can't you do a, a dynamic pose? He's got his oxygen mask off and no oxygen hose there, but he does fit in there very, very nicely. And yeah, from memory, yeah, this is photo etch parts for the back there. Uh, for that bulkhead, which I think I've yet yeah, to just dry fit it in. So the, the part quality on this is, is fantastic and is, is comparable to 
uh, the Kotari ones, but it's not as crisp because it's 148 scale and it's out of the box. So that's what that one looks like compared to, we really can't compare it, can we? Because we're talking about a, you know, a 50% increase in, in size all around. Um, but that's basically, you know, your other option. And again, you've got to use, you can see down in there, you've got to use a, some photo etch. So if you don't like bending and super gluing photo etch, it's a bit of a pain with the Tamiya kit. You've got to do that. Whereas Kotari have got it there uh, in one. So, you know, there's your options. If, if you don't like, if you don't want to go up to man scale or to 132nd scale, I shouldn't call it man scale. That's a bit rude, but there it is. Uh, if you want to, you know, if you still want a high quality looking um, Mark 1 Spitfire, then you can use the Tamiya one, but it will um, not hold up exactly because of the lack of those raised rivets at the back uh, and a, a few other things here and there. Engineering wise, it's not as good. It's time to sum up. It's time to look, get down to brass tacks. What are the pros? What are the cons uh, for this particular kit? And what improvements do I think Kotari can make? Uh, to the kit itself. Let's start with the bad bits. Okay, uh, for those of us who want to do in-flight like pose like this, there are a few things missing. There's no pilot, there's no stand. Duh, duh, duh. I'm not going to belabor that. I say that with every kit that comes out and it's just a shame that um, you know, aircraft kits don't come with that included, but there are solutions to it. And as I explained before, it's not that hard to modify to go wheels up. I think the major fault of the kit, fault that some people are saying is that there's no engine included. And I can see their point. But again, you know, you, when you're trying to develop a new kit, you know, having to, to, to have gun bays open, to have, you know, a complete interior out the back, to have a complete, you know, removable engine with removable cows, it adds another layer of complexity of tooling. And just like it is to add another, to add a pilot, I remember the FX guys, engineers, when they were doing the 124th Mark IX, they, they said, you know, adding a pilot would add 10 to 15% cost in tooling. And so that's the same approach Kotari have done. There is no Merlin engine. They may include one uh, in the future as a separate kit set that you could buy. I'm just speculating that they may do that. I'm positive that Edward and other aftermarket manufacturers and even 3D printing guys are going to do it. There's enough meat here in the in the front of the fuselage to um, to to put one in. Uh, so yeah, it's some of you will not like that. Those of you who like to pose an aircraft on the ground everything open, that's your game. Well, you know, to be honest, I reckon you should be a minority in the hobby. I don't like that, personally. Uh, I think it detracts from the view of the aircraft itself, and I applaud the way Qatari have done it. So that's a subjective opinion of mine. Uh, I'm glad that they haven't included an engine. The um, other thing that's been highlighted as a, as a possible con is the, the fact that the uh, instrument panel is you know, there's all these individual little little decals that you've got to put on instead of having, you know, one sheet or whatever. Again, I think that's a very, very minor, you know, subjective opinion. Um, yeah. And then the final one is the way that they've engineered how it is to be posed. It is po designed to be posed in regulation fashion as they were Battle of Britain um, with a couple of one or two minor options. You know, the cockpit door open, the flaps up, the elevators down, the rudder locked to um, to starboard to the right, wheels down because that's how they were parked during the battle to get ready for to scramble. That's how Kotari have done it. And the thing is, you know, if you're a good modeler, you can modify that very easily. They give you the different options. You can close up the canopy. You can close the door. Uh, no, you can't deploy. You can't deploy the flaps. But again, 99% of the time, you never see a Spitfire with flaps down unless they're landing or taking off. Uh, and you can adjust the elevators, you can just adjust the ailerons. It's all available for you. So that's the only cons I can see in the kit. There are some improvements I would suggest, but I'll leave that to the last. Let's talk about the great stuff about, about this kit. The way this has been engineered, the low parts count, but high detail, you know, 117 parts. Uh, there's almost zero uh, seam cleanup. Now, some of you older modelers are thinking, oh, that's a bit of a cop out. You know, you've got a basic modeling skills, blah, blah, blah. And I say, well, you know, I don't care if you had your opinion about that. Any kit that helps you build it, you know, takes you one step further to, oh my God, this thing's falling together. I'm really gonna get excited about the finish of it. Instead of providing a challenge, to me is a superior kit to one that's purposely putting barriers in front of you with poor engineering, poor, you know, some kits come these days with five separate fuselage pieces and you have to butt join them all together and then there's you know hours and hours of needless sanding and filling and checking seams and rechecking and when you know they've they've done the smart option here by not only eliminating a lot of effort involved for the modeler but also by 
um, keeping detail. I mean, look at the top of the fuel tank cover here. Okay, uh, on other kits, this detail is obliterated. You have to add it back on, and sometimes I don't even give you the fuel filler cap. This is all molded in nicely. The um, double row of raised rivets here along the spine is retained, and it's going to be you know a, a big feature of the kit when you look at it from top down. So these things are to be applauded. They're not cheats. They're not things to make it easier. Blah blah blah. I love it. The cockpit detail is outstanding, and it's you know it's, I think there's 70 something parts in the well, maybe not 70, maybe 50 or 60 parts in the cockpit itself. It leads itself to doing um, going nuts with detail or just doing as is, and it's a beautiful cockpit. Um, yeah, out of the box, it's fantastic. The instruction booklet, okay, this is well worth the extra money, and I'm sure it costs Kotari a lot of money to produce this cockpit in full color and all these you know the call outs. The care and attention to detail is, and you know, included reference photos everywhere. This this is amazing. Um, it's fantastic, and it's a reference um, book in of itself. Uh, the landing gear is really well engineered. For for you guys who like to do wheels down, I just did a little explanation of how it's done. Uh, there's only a small minor point into it that can be improved. That's great. There's no photo etch in the kit. I just realised that. You know, comparing it to the Tamiya kit. There's no photo etch. They didn't go and use a, um, you know, you have to bend up a brace here for the for the compass mount here. You, there's no uh, photo etch in the back. The the harnesses are molded on as plastic. So for you know for those of you who don't want to have to deal with super glue and having to bend photo etch, that's another big big plus point. The other thing, super tight tolerances, super um, high detail parts. I mean this is top of the top level. This is Tamiya Bandai Wingnut Wings. You know, the, that crescent of the, the best out there. That's what Kotari have aimed for, and they've hit it out of the ballpark. I'm looking at my list, and, you know, I could go on and on and on, but this it's just such a good kit. Improvements. What would I suggest to Kotari to improve this kit? I give it a 9.8 out of 10, or 98 out of 100, not 4 out of 10 like some bozos have done. Uh, one thing that's a possible improvement is I like how Great War Hobby, they make their inner, the outer... Um, part of their uh, instruction booklet, removable. So it actually includes the paint call out and the sprue chart uh, on the inside and back covers. And they're completely removable, whereas the main instruction booklet is, is intact. The reason for that is you can take that off, um, put that on a, on, a, on a board or a clipboard on your workbench and you've got instant access all the time. You don't have to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. A minor point, and I don't think they're gonna do it because I mean, the heritage they have with this is fantastic. The thing I would really love to see Kotari do is to box up their clear parts. Uh, they're not protected uh, well enough. There, there were some buff marks here at the top from the. They're in a separate plastic bag, but I think they should, at a minimum, be covered in foam like Trumpet or Hobby Boss do. Uh, and then even the next level is just create a small cardboard box where they slid into and nothing can nothing can touch them. Uh, I'm a bit uh, anxious about that because of my bad experience with border models who completely cocked it up. Uh, any other improvements? Well, yeah, the only thing I would improve is say, give me a pilot next time, guys. But, you know, that's about it. I can't really fault or suggest, make for any other suggestions. And I can't wait to build this, um, even though I've got a big Bahamut F-14 off the bench. So, for those of you who are still here, well done. It's been almost two hours of me waffling on about this kit without actually build, finishing it. I have, I have put it together, mind you, and it's, and it's going to be an absolute joy when I can actually put paint on plastic on this thing. But one thing at a time. Uh, I'm still not well enough to be spending hours and hours and hours at the bench. This, this review has taken me over a week to do as I'm recovering from my operation. So um, anyway, I'm glad you got to the end here and. Yeah, I hope you enjoy that as much as I did. I can't wait for the new stuff that's coming out from Kotari. We, we know for a fact there's two new kits coming out from them. They're doing the Mark I early, not the mid. So, whoop, early. The early has the two-bladed prop, uh, has the flat windscreen, a few other improvements, another 30 or so different parts. And so that'll allow you to do the um, Battle of Dunkirk, the phony war, you know, and, the, and even the pre-war spits. And they're gonna bring out the Mark V-A. So it's continuing with the A-wing, really really interesting tooling they're, they're being very smart using this one wing to do three at least three variants in fact they should be able to do the mark two as well the mark 2a um, so that's coming out as well those two have been have been announced and I do, like I said I reckon the mark uh, 2a will come out as well and if they start to re-engine do new wings I do a B wing and maybe a C wing and then boom we're into it we're doing you know 
Mark 5Bs, Mark 5Cs, and then that just completely wipes out the whole all the competition for all the early Mark um, early Merlin powered Spitfires. And good luck to them. I think they're on a winner.